Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to Lost River Church of Christ. Nice, cool Sunday morning, Thanksgiving week. Um, this morning, we, we've got the, uh, I don't know if pleasure is the right word, but we've got the, uh, the pleasure of, of covering uh, Judges chapter uh, 17 through, through 19 this morning. So if you would be, or please, would be, please go ahead and open up your Bibles to Judges uh, chapter 17. So last week, uh, Jay uh, took us through the, uh, the last of the, the cyclical judges that are recorded in the book, the story of, of Samson. But after the end of the, the stories of the different cycles and the judges that we've gone through, there's still five chapters left in the book. And there's three primary uh, different stories uh, that are left to tell in the time of the judges. You've got the, the one that's uh, covered here uh, in... Uh, in verses, or excuse me, chapters 17 and 18, uh, the story of, of Micah's idolatry uh, and, and his setting up this kind of new pervert, uh, perverted Judaism in the land, and the Danites uh, moving into the, the new land and taking control of that religion. Then you've got uh, chapters 19 through 21, which cover uh, the Levite and, and his uh, concubine and uh, the events that unfold from, uh, from that ordeal, the civil war that erupts in, in Israel and the near wiping out of the, of the tribe of, of Benjamin. But then there's one other story that takes place during the, the time of the judges that we haven't covered yet. So I know what it is. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say that goes in with uh, the the concubine, the Levites concubine, the civil war, and the, and the Benjamites near in. But there's still one other story that takes place in the time of the judges. Kind of a trick question. Yeah. Yeah, the story of, of Ruth and, and Boaz, right? That also takes place during the, the days of the judges. And we'll, we'll cover that when we wrap up our study actually in the, in the book here. But interestingly enough, all three of these stories, they have kind of unique elements. Uh, first off, they don't have anything to do with a particular judge or a particular cycle or a particular oppression that's going on uh, in the land. Uh, they're really just about what's going on in the lives of, of everyday Israelites, what's going on with the people themselves. Uh, another pretty interesting thing about all three of these stories, all three of them have ties to, to Bethlehem. In, in, in Judah. All three of them have ties to Bethlehem and Judah. They all have to do with something with uh, the land of, of Ephraim uh, as well. So these last stories, they're not, they're not connected with a particular judge or particular de deliverance cycle, but the, the people themselves. So we've been covering the, the cycle narratives up to this point and the downwardly spiraling nature of the morality of the people and their leadership up to this point. Uh, but uh, now we're going to focus on the lives of, of specific Israelites and what's going on with, with them. Uh, a peek into how Israel even kind of got into these positions to, to begin with. From a timing perspective, uh, uh, these stories, especially these first two that we'll cover in the book uh, of Judges that close out here, they don't necessarily seem to be chronologically in order with uh, the wrapping up of the story of Samson. All right? they, just, they come on into, the, into the narrative next here in the book, but they don't necessarily uh, chronologically follow, follow Samta, Samson and his, uh, his story. Uh, most likely, both of the stories happen much earlier in the time period of the judges, and there's some little contextual clues that kind of point to that, and most notably in the story of Levi and the, uh, uh, the and the, uh, the Benjamites, you'll see a, a reference to, to Phineas. Uh, and Phineas uh, was the son of, of Eleazar. He was the high priest in the land. And um, what would that mean from a timing perspective? Yeah, it'd be very early, right? Because Eleazar was the high priest who was doing work with who? With Joshua, right? He was the high priest that was doling out the land. He was the high priest in the days of Joshua. And it's his son, Phineas, who is the high priest that takes place in the time period of that story. So this is very early on in the, in the narrative of the time period of the judges. So you start to see how the people start to deteriorate really, I mean, right out of the gate, because that's probably one of the, the, the worst, the worst stories. Uh, the theme seems to be how in, in a world, and you'll see this phrase come up several times in our, in our study over the next two classes, but it says that in those days there, there was no king in Israel, right? And, and what, what's the second part of that? Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did as they saw fit, right? So that, that phrase, there was no king in Israel, definitely uh, 
tells the story of how there was no physical monarchy ruling over the people of Israel, but also the spiritual state of the people, right? God isn't ruling or God isn't serving as their, as their king in their hearts. Uh, so the people take matters into their own hands because they don't have someone over them. They don't have a God over them. They take justice and morality into their own hands. And even though in several of these stories, there's this uh, kind of loose connection and association with, with God, they still are doing things completely contrary to his will. Uh, and they set themselves up in the place of, of, of God when, when, uh, when they choose to do so, when it seems best to them. And they start to fall into the effects of the people around them, become just like the Canaanites, the people that they were supposed to come in and have a greater influence on, to ultimately to the point where there's no real discernible difference between the Israelites and the Canaanites in, our, in these stories. They start to rational, rationalize away certain godly aspects of their lives, and it gets easier and easier for them when they seemingly get away with things. And maybe they even seem to prosper by the way they, they, they deal uh, evilly with themselves and with the people around them. And at times, they even start to convince themselves that God might actually be with them in, in what they're up to. And you know, it's kind of easy, I think, to, to be... Um, <clears throat> to be harsh on the, the Israelites and the judges during this time period, and understandably so, right? We've talked about the judges and their downwardly spiraling morality, um, but now we'll look at the people and we'll see how, how depraved and, and, uh, and way off the mark they got. But um, I think the, the point being in the, in the story of judges is to, to look into these stories to remind ourselves that... Um, we have the capacity to be the exact same type of people, right? These are human beings just like we are. And while we like to convince ourselves that we would never possibly sink as low as, as these people do, uh, we'd never uh, deprave ourselves to, to such egregious uh, uh, depths. But the fact of the matter is that we have the capacity to do just the same dreadful things, both individually and collectively as a culture. The more we start to distance ourselves from God, the more we start to do what seems right in our own eyes uh, and do, by the same token, what is evil uh, in, in God's eyes. I think one of the points of these stories, kind of like the, with the Levite and his concubine, when he cuts her up and he sends her out through, through Israel, the point of his doing that was to, to spark outrage in the land, right? To... to, to make the people mad, right? And I think one of the reasons we study the book of Judges is to kind of do the same things, to spark outrage in our own lives, but to cause us to pause, to not go down uh, the, same, the same paths. Um, I'm reminded of, a, of another story, uh, not too far down the road from this one, where uh, someone comes and, and tells a man a story to provoke outrage and, and condemnation. And what was the point of that story? Or who was it, first off? Yeah, David, and well, what was uh, Nathan's, Nathan's point in that? You are the man, right? <laughs> you are the man who, you, who you've just condemned. So as we study these, these time period of the judges and these two stories specifically, I think that's important to remember that we have the capacity to be the exact same uh, type of people. Uh, another interesting point that I want to stress in these, in these stories is the, the rapidly uh, escalating and dowardly spiraling consequences of sin that's introduced, uh, uh, most, at, most specifically at the lowest level in our, in our culture. Sin, and, and more precisely, you could say influence in Scripture is uh, a lot of times referred to as leaven, right? And what's the point of referring to influence or to sin that way? What is leaven? What's it used for? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's used to, it, to make, make bread grow, right? When you're baking bread. It, so it has this uh, permeating influence. Once it gets uh, input into the system, it permeates and it spreads and it gets bigger. It gets, it gets uh, uh, more, uh, more overreaching. And the sin uh, that the people start off with here is relatively small, but it turns out to have uh, huge consequences uh, throughout the land. When we look at our first story this, this morning, it's kind of easy to look at this in, uh, in reverse order to kind of see how this plays out. The end of uh, the first narrative in 17 and 18, it ends with the Danites taking over this quaint little unsuspecting town in the outskirts of, of the region uh, and then setting up this whole new religion and this whole new priesthood there. And how did all that start? With Micah stealing from his mom. <laughs> Right? That's, how, that's how that story kicks off in, in, in chapter 17. And the other story that we'll look at with the Levite and the Benjamites, uh, there is this civil war that breaks out in the land. 
um, and it nearly uh, wipes out the whole tribe of Benjamin and to the point where they actually have to go literally hunt for wives for themselves so that they can maintain, a, maintain and stay a people and a tribe. And that all started because of a marital dispute between a Levite and his, and his concubine and she running off and leaving her, her husband. So you'll see that you know, these two nationwide crises uh, breaking out within uh, the land all started with two household matters, right? Two household sins. A man stealing from his mom and a, and a husband and wife that, that go, their, go their separate ways. So I think one of the things that we can point out in this is the fact, uh, like Jordan Peterson uh, says in, in one of his books, you know, one of his rules for life is clean up your room. You know, before you start trying to tackle the problems of the world, make sure your own house is in order, right? Make sure that you have control over the things that you immediately have control of because they do have an influence, right? Leaven, I said it's typically representative of sin, but leaven uh, is really more influence because Jesus referred to the kingdom of heaven as, as leaven in Matthew chapter 13. So what type of influence are the things that you immediately have control over? What type of effect are they going to have on your uh, family, on your community, and ultimately at the, the, the world at large, because as you can see from these stories, they can clearly uh, go that way. All right, so moving into our text this morning, uh, in Judges chapter 17, you're immediately introduced to this new character named uh, Micah, and it says that he is from the, the mountains of, of Ephraim. And you can't see this very well, but uh, his, his name, uh, Micah, means who is like Yahweh. And this is the Hebrew rendering of, of this, the first verse there. And you can see, uh, if you can, the, the name of Micah spelled out in, in Hebrew. So who is like Yahweh is what his name means. And he's only referred that, uh, that way by the full listing of his name two times in the book. Um, in verse, verse 1 and in verse 4. After that, the other 18 times that Micah's name is spelled out in Hebrew in, in this narrative, it drops something. I don't know if you can see what it drops. It drops the Yahweh portion of his name, right? So uh, if you can see how, you know, um, the Y-E-H-U in the, in the English alphabet is kind of is dropped from his name throughout the rest of it. So his name means who is like Yahweh. But the narrator, the, the storyteller here, can't even come to terms with calling him Micah through the rest of the story because his name means who is like Yahweh, and he is, Micah turns out to be nothing like God, not even really a follower of God by the, by the end of the story. Uh, so I just thought that'd be interesting to, to point out there. But um, it starts out with him in, in chapter 17 confessing to a crime. We don't even have the story of uh, how the crime was perpetrated or really how it came about. Well, what's the crime that he's confessing to? Yeah, he steals uh, 1,100 shekels of, of silver from his, his mother. So he steals this very large sum of money uh, from his mom, who was unnamed here. We don't know anything else about this crime uh, other than the fact that these people are fairly wealthy. Uh, I do think it is interesting to note that, uh, although I don't think his mother here, even though she's unnamed, I don't think this, that she is Delilah, but 1,100 shekels of silver was the exact same sum of money that Delilah received to betray Samson to the Philistines, right? So I think that might just be the narrator's way of telling uh, or connecting these two stories and saying maybe that they even came into this money, maybe they came into this wealth by uh, evil means. That's certainly how uh, Micah himself comes into it. But then he returns the money. And why does it say he returns the money when he confesses in verse 1? Yeah, she would pronounced a curse on, on whoever took it, right? So, you know, and she said it in his hearing. And so he wises up and, you know, it's not necessarily any sort of uh, conviction of a sin or, or guilt. It's like, I don't want this curse hanging over me. I don't want to, to be uh, experiencing the, the effects of this, this curse. Uh, so he gives the money back to her. And what's her response to that? Finding out her son stole from her, but now he, he gives the money back after she pronounced this curse. What's her response? Yeah, it says that she wholly dedicates the, the, the sum to, to the Lord. For what purpose? Yeah, to make, to make an idol for God, right? I'm, I'm wholly dedicating this, this sum uh, uh, to ultimately, we can create this idol uh, and, and offer it up to God. Interestingly enough, she does use here the covenant name of Yahweh, and that's important to recognize throughout this story because it'll kind of come up uh, at different time periods. But usually in your English uh, texts, 
uh, the when it's when it's Yah when Yahweh or Jehovah is used, it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in your text. That or, or if it uses God, it's capital G, capital O, capital D. So all all capitals means it's the covenant name of God that's being used. Otherwise, it's one of the generic terms uh, for for God or for Lord. But here she says, you know, we can dedicate it to Jehovah. All right. So she does seem to have the appropriate deity in mind, but when she dedicates this uh, sum of money back to God, and she kind of blesses her son too, right? She blesses her son in the name of, of, of Yahweh, kind of trying to reverse the effects of the curse. So you can already see the, the pagan-like uh, responses to God by calling this blessing on someone, or calling this cursing on someone doing, doing you harm, but then like a reverse blessed, or reverse curse blessing just kind of make it, uh, make it counteract like these magical things that they can just call on, on God to do. But she says that she will wholly dedicate the sum, uh, and she gives it to her son to, to make this carved image. But how much does she actually give? Two hundred shekels of silver. Now, I'm a professional financier. You know, I do dabble in some accounting, and I can tell you, in my professional opinion, that 200 is less than 1,100 by a decent, uh, a decent sum, 82% to be, to be precise. So has she wholly dedicated what she said she was going to dedicate? No, not even, not even close. But Micah takes the money and he, he does just that. He, he sets up these, these false uh, 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 idols, these images, these graven images. Now they are probably, or they're supposed to be in reference to God, kind of reminiscent of the golden calves uh, at, at Mount Sinai. So they try to make these idols in, in, in place of God and he takes it a step further, right? He turns it into a, a whole new religion. He gets this idea that, hey, um, I can make these idols and then I can make my house a temple. I can make my, my home a, a shrine. I could make an ephod. I can make these religious garments and I can set up an entirely new religion where I don't have to be dependent on these, these outside, uh, outside forces. And it says that he even sets his, his son up as, as priest. So he creates this whole, whole new religion uh, out of this stealing uh, of the, the money from his mother. And then in verse 6, it introduces that, that first time we, we see this phrase, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So you definitely see that playing out in the life of, of, of Micah here. Uh, then next, in the next verse, we're introduced to this wandering Levite uh, who it says is from uh, Bethlehem uh, and he's, he's coming to town. And he's basically just this homeless nomad who's, who's wandering around. First off, Bethlehem is not one of the 48 prescribed Levitical cities. So he was somewhere that he wasn't supposed to be in, in a sense. And now he's just wandering around. It says that he's just looking for a place. So he, he doesn't have anywhere to go. He's just wandering around looking for, looking for work. And it's kismet, right? That he, he falls in with, uh, with Micah here and they decide to, to you know, make this thing uh, legitimate, make this thing uh, real. So he says, hey, I've got this thing going here in my house where I've set up this new religion. One thing I seem to be lacking is a, is a Levite. So you can see even Micah has the, uh, enough understanding to know that his religion that he set up truly isn't real. It truly really isn't legitimate because as soon as he sees a Levite, he knows, okay, well, this would be better. This would be better if I can do that. So he approaches the Levite and he says, uh, Hey, I'll, I'll give you a handsome little salary. I'll pay for our, all of your expenses. Why don't you come into my house and be a, a father and a, and a priest to me? Now, it's interesting because it said earlier in the text that this Levite was a, a young man, right? And so Micah comes to him and says, I want you to be a father to me. Um, you know, father kind of being an honorary title of, of, of leadership within, within the home. So he wants, he wants this young Levite to be the, the spiritual leader of, of, his, of his house, of his home. And how does the Levite respond to that? Yeah, I'm content with that. I can, I can make that work. Uh, so he's like, yeah, paid to be a priest to a small family. I can, that, that, sounds, uh, that sounds pretty good. So the Levite goes along with it. Uh, and, uh, you know, of anyone in this possible story, the Levite should have been one to, to know better, to understand the law of God, to know that this is way off base but he's thinking, you know, I was homeless, now I'm not, so this, this must be good. This is, things are working out. And then an ironic uh, turn of phrase, it says that when Micah does bring him into the house, it says that the young man became like a son to Micah, right? Now, Micah had just called him to be the father in the house, right? Come, in, come into my house and be a father to me, be a leader. But it says now that the young man becomes like a son to Micah. So 
you can see really who is, who is leading who. Uh, and because of this uh, development, you'll see that uh, Micah understood his religion to be way off base, but now he's convinced himself that if I have this Levite in my service, then God will surely look favorably upon me, right? This will be, this legitimizes what I'm doing if I've got a Levite here and God will be pleased with what's going on. So, of course, none of that is, is true and that should serve as a warning for us not to pervert the, the true word of God to suit our own ambitions or, or lack thereof. All right? So then the story moves on into uh, to chapter 18 and it kind of switches scenes a little bit to the Danites who are, are looking for uh, a new home. And they're in a bad way because they just can't seem to get a hold of or they just can't seem to keep a hold of their allotted territory. It actually says there in verse 18 that their inheritance uh, had not fallen on them. All right. So back in in Joshua uh, chapter 19 verses 40 through 48, you actually had the the lot that was given to to Dan and the the, uh, land that was given to them. Interestingly enough, they were the very last lot that was given out, but they were given land in the the coastal, uh, the western coastal lands of of Israel. Um, And actually in that section in in Joshua 19 mentions them going up to uh, Lashim or Laish here and and renaming it Dan. So you've got the full telling of the story now here in in, uh, Judges chapter uh, 18. And then Judges chapter 1 at the beginning kind of talked about how they, the Danites were being forced by the Amorites uh, into the, the mountainous region of, of their, their tribe. All right. So here's a, a map of where the Danites were supposed to be over here in the, uh, the western territory along the coastal regions, kind of the, in the land of the Philistines there. But they were being pushed back into the mountains. And the, the, our text opens up here where it says they were living in Zorah and, and Eshtal. And Zorah was where, where Samson is from or or will be from, depending on the timing aspect of this. But these are border towns on the far eastern side of the land. So they're supposed to have this entire territory, good fertile land uh, with uh, coastal access. Deborah's song talks about them staying on their ships when they were called to action. Uh, But they end up all the way up here in the north in uh, Lashem or Laish, and the city that they end up renaming Dan. So they're, they end up a long way from home, a long way from where where God uh, prescribed them to be. Um, because they seem to be displaced and they don't have the ability to take over this, this land uh, because of their own lack of following the word of God uh, and, and, and following through on his command to take possession of the land with his support, they decide to take matters into their own hands. Right? Uh, you know, we can, let, let's figure this one out for ourselves. So what do they decide to do? Yeah, they decide to send these spies out to, to search the land, right? And then I think this is meant to kind of parallel and uh, think, make us think back to the sending out of the original spies back in, in Numbers chapter 13. But they send five men from, from their clan, and these spies go into the, uh, to search out the land to find a place for them to, to be able to spread out and have enough room. Uh, it says that the spies go into the mountainous uh, regions of, of Ephraim on their journey, and then lo and behold, who do they run into? Yeah, they run into to Micah. Uh, and as soon as they get there, uh, they, they run into the Levite. And it says that they kind of recognize his voice. Probably that likely means they kind of hear his dialect, hear his accent. And that's a, they, they recognize that, okay, he's not from Ephraim. Uh, he's probably a Levite. So tell me your story. You know, what do you, they ask him these questions, you know, what are you doing here? How did you get here? What's the, what are the circumstances of you even being here for us to run into you uh, today? And then he kind of gives them the, the Seinfeld uh, yada, yada, yada there and says, Micah ended up hiring me as his priest, right? So that's how, that's just basically how the, the story unfolds. Micah has hired me as his priest. Now you have to understand this is a, a novel uh, idea in, in the time. I think this is the first instance of this kind of religion for hire playing out within the nation of Israel specifically, maybe with the exception of Balaam and, and Barak, but that obviously had negative uh, connotations associated with it for the people of Israel. But they're like, what, you can just set up your own household religion? You can just set up your own priest? Well, no, but these people are doing what seems right in their own eyes, and they, they do it anyway. So they're intrigued by this new idea, this new way to follow after God, this new way of, of approaching and trying to be close to him. So what do they ask the Levite? 
yeah, tell us about, tell us about our trip that we're on, right? Uh, tell us about our journey, our adventure to go find new land. Is, is God with us? Will our, will our journey uh, be prosperous? It's interesting when they ask the priest, they say, and this is what I was talking about with the names earlier, when they say, inquire of God for us. Notice the word God there. It's not, not all capitalized. So they are using the generic uh, Hebrew term for Elohim, right? So they're not using God's real name. So you can kind of see their disassociation with, with true uh, Judaism and true uh, Yahweh worship. They say, inquire of Elohim for us and ask him if our, our journey, our mission here will, will be prosperous. And the priest doesn't seem to have to dwell on this too long, right? He doesn't have to spend a lot of time in, in sorcery or, or divination or trying to conjure up and determine what the will of God is here. It seems like he just kind of immediately responds to them. And what's he say? Yep. Peace to you. All's good. You, you, God will be with you uh, in, in whatever you're doing, right? And of course, that's what uh, a, a paid man of God would say. They, he tells them what they, they want to hear. Everything's fine. Everything's great. And of course, this again isn't true, and God doesn't have to do anything with this completely human endeavor that's, that's playing out here. So the spies end up uh, leaving Micah's house, leaving Micah's compound, and they make their way on up to Laish. And what do they find? In Laish. It's good land, right? It's a, it's, it's pretty, it, it's, it's quaint, it's good, it's fertile, it's lush. Uh, the actual uh, Lashem term that was used earlier means jewel, right? It's a jewel of a land. It's, it's good land for them to grab a hold of. And what about the people there? Easy, right? <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're completely unsuspecting. They're completely confident. You know, we could come in and take this, this thing no problem. They don't even live close to anybody else who would be able to step in and, and, and intervene if, uh, if that were to, to come about. So this land is going to be easy to take. And actually, they say something there about how, you know, because of how far it is away and no one else would be able to intervene, nobody would be able to do the same thing to them, right? So in a, in a time period where Everybody's wanting to do what's right in his own eyes. These Danites are trying to get on to the far outskirts of the land that God prescribed to them so that they can be unashamed as well by the, the impact of maybe the, the faithful Israelites who are still living in the land. Um, so they go back and they tell the report to the people uh, uh, back in the, the original allotment to Dan. And they say, let's go. What are you waiting for? Actually, it's kind of interesting. And in, again, in the Hebrew text, uh, when uh, they get to the the Danites elders, and they say, how is your, they don't even finish the sentence, right? They say, what is your report in English? The, the English fills in the word report there, but the word report isn't in the, the original Hebrew. It's like they cut them off before they could even finish the question. Like, you got to come. This is going to be great. Why are you guys delaying? We got to get up right now and go take it. It'll be, it'll be easy. And they kind of recount how good the land is and how easy it will be to take. So it says in the, in the next section uh, that, uh, 600 Danites move on to go with them to, to take over this, this uh, unprescribed land far, far in the north. And they, these 600 men get up and, and gather weapons of war to go on their journey. So this isn't some kind of peaceful relocation. They're, they're ready to do battle. Now, the number 600 seems kind of small, doesn't it? I mean, the last census that we read about back in, in Numbers, the 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 Danites had 64,000 men ready to fight. And even just from what we've read thus far in Judges, when the Israelites needed to muster up a significant number of troops, they seemed to be able to do that, right? I mean, you'd have 10,000 men, 20,000 men be able to, to, to be gathered up. But here, only 600 men are going along uh, with this uh, adventure to go up and take this, this city of Laish. So it's almost like the rest of the tribe isn't, isn't quite sure about it. And they possibly stay behind, and then the rest of the Danites just kind of disappear from, from history altogether. But in any case, uh, these 600 Danites and their five spies who are leading them, they make their way uh, back up through Ephraim, and they stop at uh, Micah's house along the way. Uh, as, uh, you kind of see the dialogue that's played out here. It's kind of interesting. They're like, the five spies turn around and talk to the other 600 men, like, do you know what this guy's got here? <laughs> He's got his own religion. He's got his own idols set up. He's got his own priest. He's got his own ephod. You know, he's got his own way of approaching God. You know what we should do? And that's just, it just leaves it right there. It is, you know, then there's no answer to the questions. Like, do you know what we should do? 
And the key is, let's take that for ourselves, right? If anybody can do that, then we can too. Let's, uh, let's take it and, and make it our, our own. So, you know, it's kind of funny. One wonders why they even bother at all with these non-religious <laughs> religious ideas. But I, I think that definitely plays into the, the part of man that, that has to have this fundamental desire to worship something that is supposed to be greater than themselves. But then we twist that and we make that into whatever we need it to be to fulfill our, our own desires. So the original five spies that say that they go in and they play it friendly uh, with uh, the Levite while the 600 men of muscle wait outside. Uh, and they go in and they start boxing everything up. Right? They start taking all the stuff uh, for themselves to, to steal and to take with them on their way up to, up to Lashem. And it says that the priest outside and the warriors uh, who are with him, he, the priest sees what's happening. And he says, wait, wait what, are, what, are you guys, what are you guys doing? Right? And what is, uh, how do the, uh, the Danites respond? Yeah. First they say, be quiet. Right? Uh, literally they say, uh, put your hand over your mouth. So maybe they're kind of doing this in secret. And it appears that Dan, or not Dan, uh, Micah may not be here for this. But put your hand over your mouth. We want you to, to come with you because wouldn't it be better if you were the priest to a whole tribe instead of just one family? And uh, how does the Levite respond to that? Right, like a real Levite should, right? No, this is, this is all wrong. I got to go back. What's he say? Yeah, it says his heart was made glad by this. So you definitely see the character of this unnamed Levite up to this point. And the reason he's unnamed, we'll get his name a little bit later, but he's supposed to be kind of representative of all of the Levites of the people of Israel. And who are the Levites supposed to be? Yeah, the priests of God, right? The, re the religious mediators for the people to God. And if this representation is, is anything about the, the state of the Levite uh, group as a whole, well, then the nation's in a, in a bad way because this guy's just going to the highest bidder, right? And he'll tell anybody what they want to hear if they, they pay the, the right amount. Um, so uh, this makes him happy and he gets all of his fake priestly stuff and he decides to, to go uh, right along with them. So you see the full depravity and the, the uselessness of this, this Levite priest here. And then uh, Micah heads out uh, after the people, uh, after they'd uh, gotten away a little bit, and Micah catches up to them, and then he says, you know, what are you guys, you know, what are you guys doing? And what do they respond to him? Like, what's your problem? He's like, well, you took my, you took my gods, you took my priests, you took everything from me. I don't have anything left. That's a sad enough phrase in and of itself, that you took the gods that I'd made. It really definitely shows something about these these gods that they are claiming to be worshiping. But then he says, I've got nothing left. And you've taken, you've taken everything from me. So when you put your faith and you put your, uh, your pride and your support on things that are physical like this, this is the, the end all be all of how that, how that ends. And ironically, Micah's mother's curse definitely has now come to pass for his stealing earlier uh, in, the, in the story. But they say, hey, you need to go back home uh, before something bad happens to you. <laughs> you know, there's 600 of us here. You, you talk loud enough, somebody's going to get mad and do something about it. And, and oh yeah, they're going to go back to your families as well. So Micah doesn't seem to have any choice and they, he goes back home. And then the story kind of quickly ends there with the Danites going up to Laish because that really wasn't the main point of the story. The main point of the story was the, the depravity of Israel and the, the falsehood of the religion that they're starting to introduce. But Anyway, the Danites end up taking Laish and they set up their new, new profane worship there. Um, and then finally, in the, ver the last two verses, 30 and 31, the, the name of the Levite is revealed. His name is Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Moses. All right, so it's like they kind of left this little tidbit out right until the end, and it's kind of like, whoa, a, a direct descendant of Moses is involved in this? And you really see how far the, the people have, have fallen here. Um, then moving into the next, uh, the next story in chapter 19, again, a Levite is one of the central characters. This one again is, is nameless, but he'll stay nameless, uh, throughout the, the whole, whole story. Uh, and you'll notice that no one else in the story is, is named, uh, either. Everyone is anonymous throughout the, the rest of this, this chapter and, and chapters 20 and 21 for that matter. Uh, and I think the reason for that is, is twofold. One is to 
like we, like we explained earlier, to illustrate that these characters, although they are real, are metaphorical representations of, of the people uh, as a whole, right? This unnamed Levite is, is any man who is supposed to be a religious leader of, of God's people. The, the woman is any daughter who has the capacity to be victimized by immoral and unrighteous men. The old Ephraimite man is, is any household leader who's willing to compromise him, himself and rationalize uh, evil away for the sake of, of maintaining social customs. And the, the men of, of Gibeah who do their horrible act or any of us who let our evil passions and desires just run rampant in our lives to the point where we become uh, animalistic. And I think too, you know, names mean something. Names personalize people and provide something of a, of a life to individuals in, in a sense. But the rampant sin in this story shows the, the dehumanizing effect, I think, that it has to the point where these people don't even, don't even need names because of how bad things have, have gotten. Uh, the only person, like I mentioned earlier, who is called by name is, is Eliezer, which tells us about the timing of this event. Um, so it starts off in, in verse 1 of chapter 19, again, talking about the state of the, the nation. There is no king in Israel. It doesn't use the phrase that everyone's doing right in his own eyes, but I think that's implied, as we'll see uh, throughout the rest of the story. But uh, we're introduced to this Levite from uh, the hills of Ephraim who's taken this concubine from Bethlehem. All right, so he apparently has, has, has bought this woman maybe from her house in, in Bethlehem, uh, and you'll again see these central elements of the story. A Levite who was not in a Levitical town. It said that he was living in a remote area of, of Ephraim. You've got Ephraim mentioned again, and you've got Bethlehem mentioned again. Now, a concubine was something like a, a second-class wife, like something like a slave wife, right? She had to fulfill all the marital obligations of being married to this man, but without any of the, the legal benefits. And that's kind of covered in the law to a degree in Deuteronomy 15 and, and 21. But it says there, the, the second verse immediately, that she plays the harlot with him. And she leaves and she goes back to her, her, her home, back to her father, who apparently receives her. Uh, and immediately we're made to think that she's committed some kind of an act of, of adultery, like sleeping with another man. But the phrase, played the harlot, can have a, a lot of meanings, including just leaving. Because uh, in this day and age, there was no uh, legal remedy for a woman to divorce the man. So her just leaving and going back home could be the playing of the harlot. Uh, the Septuagint adds uh, this phrase that she was angry with the Levite, and she was upset with him, that she actually despised him, and that's why she, she goes back home. And based on what we find out about the Levite later, I think that can, that can make sense, that he's not really of, of one of high moral character. But in any case, whatever the reason, whatever actually happened, she goes back home. It says that after four months, uh, the Levite goes uh, to get her, goes to bring her back. Uh, and when he gets to the, the, his father-in-law's house, it says that she receives him in. And then they all have a, a good time together, right? So it's, he's like, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that my, my, my son-in-law and my daughter are going to reconcile. and Maybe we can get this thing back on track. Uh, but they end up staying there for three days, eating and drinking, and everything seems to be good. And then you kind of got this uh, excessive hospitality that the father-in-law shows on, uh, on this Levite by trying to get him to stay the original three days. But even after that, hey, why don't you stay another day? And then why don't you stay another day? And then finally it gets to a point where the, the Levite isn't going to appease his father-in-law anymore. And he sets out uh, late in the afternoon. And so even with that, with that first little phrase right here about the excessive hospitality of the father-in-law, you start to see these connections between another story uh, that's almost, almost exactly like it back in Genesis chapter 19, the story of, of Lot and the angels that, that came to Sodom, right? Because that started with the angels going to visit um, Abraham, who shows them excessive hospitality, and then they go on into the land. So here's where we'll start to see these, uh, these similarities. Uh, now, they were in Bethlehem. That's where they, he went to go pick her up. And it says that they're going to try to make it back to uh, Gibeah or Ramah, which is in the top left. And they decide to bypass Jebus or Jerusalem here. All right? Now, they're leaving late in the afternoon. That was kind of a, a part of the story uh, about them trying to stay around with the father-in-law a little bit longer. Um, and they're about six miles or so from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. All right? So that's maybe about a two to three hour journey. All right? But the uh, Levite says, no, 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 we're not going to stop in, in, in Jebus. That, that's a foreign town. We're not going to stay somewhere where there's not Israelites who are in control. Right? He's got that, that great idea. Who, who knows what type of people are in, are in Jerusalem? So they decide to bypass that and go another six miles on the way up to Gibeah. So that's probably about another two to three hour journey. 
So if you're le- leaving in mid-afternoon and you've got five hours of travel under you, by the time they get to Gibeah, it's, it's evening. It's late in the day. It's starting to get dark. And so they make their way on into town, uh, and it says that they're staying in the, uh, uh, in the square of the land, trying to find someone who's going to take them in. But no one does it. No one shows them any kind of hospitality, which was the custom for the day. Uh, then a, an old Ephraimite man uh, is coming in at his day of work out in the fields, and he sees them hanging out in the square, and he says, you know, who are you? Where are you from? You're clearly not from around here. And so the, the Levite tells him a little bit about their backstory. He says, well, I'm, I'm from Ephraim, like you, uh, but, you know, I've gone down to Bethlehem, and now we're heading on our way back home. So it kind of gives them pieces of the story. He doesn't tell him that, hey, this is my concubine, and I went down to get her because she left me. He leaves out, <laughs> leaves out those details. You just kind of tell him, you know, just the, just the facts that he wants him to hear. And so the Ephraimite says, well, why don't you come on in and, and, and stay with me tonight? Whatever you do, don't stay out here in the square. Right? I'm just going to get that, that ominous uh, overtone about uh, what type of place uh, this is. So uh, while they're enjoying themselves out in the, at this, this dinner, this celebration, eating and drinking uh, and enjoying one another's company, there's this um, pounding at the door, right? And uh, says that these worthless men, uh, these sons of Belial, which is the, and. and uh, synonym for Satan in the New Testament. These sons of Satan come pounding on the door and they, they cry out to the, the homeowner, they cry out to the old Ephraimite and they say, bring out the, the man who came to you today so that we can rape him. All right? And so you, you just see the complete depravity of these people. And again, we're in Gibeah, which is a Benjamite town. They passed up uh, Jebus because of the type of town that they were thinking it might be. But there was no hospitality shown to them. This one man who does take them in and seems to possibly have some redeeming qualities about him. He goes out and tries to intervene. Uh, but they want the Levite to come out and have, have sex with him. Um, now, it's interesting that they don't want just the, the... There was the male servant that was traveling with the Levite, and he had his concubine as well. They don't want the other man. They don't want the concubine. They want the Levite. So again, you kind of see the depravity of the people and how they're treating the the priesthood of God, the Levites in, in their, their day and age, how far they have uh, fallen. Uh, the old man, he goes outside and he says, well, that, that, would be, that would be extremely wicked if you guys take this, this male companion who have, I've made a guest in my house. I've got a better idea. Why don't you take my virgin daughter and why don't you take uh, the man's concubine instead? So you see how, I mean, he's kind of rationalizing, rationalizing away this evil deed that's going to, he's basically abandoning his role as father to be a better host, right? And so he's, he's making things that, or he's doing things that seem right in his own eyes. And he tells the, the men to do the same with these two women, right? He says, you, you take them, humble them, do whatever seems uh, best to you. And there's that phrase again, do whatever seems right in your own eyes. Uh, but the Levite, or the, excuse me, the, the Gibeites don't want anything to do with that. So they keep, they keep insisting. So what happens? Yeah, it, it says that he took the, the concubine's wife. The he there is kind of ambiguous, but I take it to be the Levite himself. He takes his concubine and he throws her out uh, to the rabble, right? And it's a, a long and, and terrible night for, for her there. It says that they literally rape and abuse her all night long until morning. And at the light of day in the morning, they let her go, all right? And so she's somehow able to wander and, and, and stumble back home, crawl back home, and there she collapses at the, at the threshold of the door. She can't even knock to, to, uh, to try to get someone to come out to help her. And again, you see something of the character of the Levi. He was the one that threw her out, but he doesn't he doesn't go after her this time, right? When she left him, he was willing to go after her, but he doesn't go out and check on her or try to do anything this time. Actually, when he gets up the next morning, it says that this is after the light of day, so apparently he slept in, and he almost trips over her on, her, on his way out the door. So it actually says, the English versions, a lot of them drop the word behold, but it says, behold, there she was on the floor. So it was a surprise that she was even there. He probably wasn't expecting to ever, ever even see her again. But uh, she's there lying on the, on the ground when he, uh, when he leaves the next morning. And what does he do? Yeah. <laughs> Again, just an extremely heartless and, and, and callous way. He just says, get up. It's, it's time to go. And uh, she doesn't respond uh, because the text here doesn't, isn't really specific as to whether she's dead at this point or not. Actually, uh, 
the, uh, the Hebrew that it will say when he grabs hold of her to cut her up into pieces is the same word that was used when it says they grabbed her and threw her outside, right? The implication being by force. So I think it's very likely that it was actually the Levite who ends up killing her himself uh, later when they get home because she's damaged goods. She's of no use to him anymore. She's more used to him dead than alive. But in any case, he picks her up, puts her on her donkey, and they, they go back home. Um, and when they get there, they, he cuts her up into 12 pieces. He kills her, cuts her up into 12 pieces, and sends her out throughout the land to try to stir up these emotional responses among the people to go back and get revenge on the Benjamites for the way they were behaving. So you see a, a people of God, the, this, this town who was supposed to be of God, being the Sodom of the story. I mean, you see definitely how far the people have fallen. We're definitely in need of a, of a redeeming story, a good story, especially after one like the one we've studied this morning, but unfortunately it won't come for a while. Jay will pick up uh, on Wednesday with chapters 20 and 21, and then we'll